Good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Today's date is 23rd August 2023. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Before we get into the discussion, I have an important announcement. Shankar AS Academy's pre-storming test series is about to begin on 11th September. The first test will happen on 18th September and other details regarding the test is given here. You can go through it. Now let us get into the discussion. Look at this article. Yesterday, Indian government released its own car crash testing program named Bharat NCAP. So from October 1, car manufacturers can volunteer to get their models tested under Bharat NCAP and get a star rating indicating their safety. So this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us see about Bharat NCAP in detail. See, Bharat NCAP is a short form for Bharat New Car Assessment Program. It is a new car safety assessment program which proposes a mechanism of awarding star ratings to automobiles based on their performance in crash test. The program is modeled by Towards Zero Foundation. This Bharat NCAP is similar to Global NCAP. So Bharat NCAP standard is aligned with Global Benchmarks. The program is about awarding star ratings to automobiles based on their performance in crash test. The Bharat NCAP assessment will allocate star ratings from 1 to 5 stars. Currently, the program will be applicable to passenger vehicles with a maximum of 8 seats. The testing protocols was named as Automotive Industry Standard 197 and it will be published soon. Now, coming to the testing procedure. See, an original equipment manufacturer must nominate a vehicle for testing. Following this, representatives from Bharat NCAP will visit the manufacturing facility or a dealer outlet to select the base variant of model through random sampling and send it to the testing center in coordination with CIRT. Here, CIRT is a central institute of road transport. Three parameters will be evaluated in the testing. It includes adult occupant protection, child occupant protection and safety assist technologies present in the car. Based upon the evaluation, a rating between 1 to 5 stars will be assigned to the vehicle. Following this, the test results will be approved by Bharat NCAP Standing Committee and it will be published on their website. Then the Central Institute of Road Transport will issue the final certificate. So this is how the testing mechanism actually works. See this new mechanism is very significant because India has second highest number of road accidents after US. And we have highest number of road deaths with 1.5 lakh death per year. The fact is that these fatalities are taking place at lower speed compared to other countries. So India is currently in desperate need for quality automobiles that can save human life even if the accidents occur. In that line, Bharat NCAP is a good initiative. Star rating of Indian cars based on crash test will not only ensure structural and passenger safety in cars, but also increase the export worthiness of Indian automobiles. This will help in making our automobile industry self-reliant with the mission of making India number one automobile hub in the world. Despite all this significance, there are some challenges. For example, setting up of testing facilities requires huge budgetary support and huge infrastructural development. Major cities in India have hardly 6 to 10 percentage of their total land allocation to the construction of transport infrastructure. So this has led to inadequate transport infrastructure in cities with reference to the population and its requirements. In conclusion, the testing protocol should be aligned with global crash test protocols allowing original equipment manufacturers from India to get their vehicles tested at India's own in-house testing facilities. So this is all about this discussion. We have seen important points about Bharat NCAP the testing procedures and the significance of the Bharat NCAP. Now let us move to the next part of our discussion. Look at this editorial article. It is written by Mr. PDT Achari, who is a former Secretary General of Lok Sabha. He has highlighted the issue with Lily Thomas judgment and also presents some arguments 
to restore the section 8 class 4 of representation of people act 1951 this is the overall essence of the article in our discussion today let us cover important points mentioned in the article before that the syllabus is highlighted here for your reference now to understand the editorial better we must first brush up the basics let us start with section 8 of representation of people act 1951 Section 8 of Representation of People Act 1951 provides various offences a conviction on which will result in the disqualification of legislators so the editorial here focuses on section 8 class 3 and section 8 class 4 of Representation of People Act 1951 here i have displayed the exact text of section 8 of RP Act 1951 So basically what the section 8 class 3 says that if a legislator is convicted of offence and faces imprisonment for more than 2 years then the legislator shall be disqualified further it also says that same legislator will be barred from contesting elections for 6 years after his release from prison so this is about the section 8 class 3 now moving on to the section 8 class 4 of the act So this section says that disqualification of MP or MLA does not take place immediately after the conviction. Instead, this section provides for 3 month grace period during which disqualification does not apply. During this 3 months when a appeal is admitted, the disqualification would depend on the final outcome of the appeal. Let us understand this concept with an example. Let's say person A is a MLA Unfortunately person A is convicted of serious crime and is sentenced to for 2 years imprisonment so according to the section 8 class 4 since he is already a member of legislature the rule about disqualification won't be applied immediately upon his conviction instead it will only come into effect after 3 months from the date of his conviction if a person A decided to appeal the conviction within those 3 months the disqualification will come into effect only when the court makes a decision about his appeal so this rule allows elected representatives some time to challenge the conviction before they are disqualified from their position see this section was struck down by supreme court in lilly thomas judgment in lilly thomas versus union of india case in 2013 supreme court said that mp's mlas or mlcs member of legislative council if they are convicted of a crime and given a minimum of 2 year imprisonment they will lose their membership of the house with immediate effect the supreme court mentioned that article 102 and article 191 of the constitution does not create any difference between the elected representative and a candidate contesting in the election with respect to disqualification here note that article 102 deals with the disqualification of mps and article 191 deals with the disqualification of mlas so the supreme court through lilly thomas judgment tried to bring parity between the candidates who are contesting in the elections and sitting members let me explain this with another example this example happens before lilly thomas case see there are two persons a and b they are contesting in elections now they are accused in different cases right the court provides a judgment for person a before the election and declares that he is a convict so this result in the disqualification of person a from contesting elections now the person b who is accused in a case contests in the election process and wins the person becomes a legislator but after the election the court provides a judgment that person b is a convict here the person b is not immediately disqualified he is provided with a 3 month grace period under section 8 of rp act so in that period if the person b just files an appeal then he will not be disqualified by looking at this example you can see there is clear disparity between a candidate contesting for elections and a sitting legislator to remove this disparity only in lilly thomas case judgment The Supreme Court struck down the Section 8, Class 4 of RP Act 1951. So we have covered the basics of the case. Now let us see the arguments presented by author of the editorial. The first argument is regarding 
the section 8 class 3 of RP Act and article 103 of Constitution. If you notice the text of section 8 class 3 of RP Act carefully, it has the word shall be disqualified. Here, since the words shall be disqualified is used, it does not mean instantaneous disqualification. Only if the words like shall stand disqualified is used, it means instantaneous disqualification. So, the section 8 class 3 of the act only uses the word shall be disqualified. It means that after the court convicts a legislator and provides a present sentence of more than two years, then the particular legislator shall be disqualified by some authority. Now who is that authority? Secretary General of Parliament or Secretary General of State Legislature cannot be granted such power. This is because the constitution does not have any provision that provides such power to Secretary General of Parliament or Secretary General of State Legislature. The author says that this authority could be provided to President under Article 103 of the Constitution. Now look at the Article 103. It says that if an issue or question arises in regard to disqualification of Member of Parliament, then that issue will be referred to President and President can give his final decision. It also says that if President is giving his decision, he must consult with the Election Commission and the President must act according to the opinion shared by Election Commission. The author also refers to the Consumer Education and Research Society vs. Union of India case 2009. In this case, the Supreme Court mentioned that even if a legislature is convicted by court and provided a sentence of more than two years, the particular legislator shall be disqualified only after it is referred to the president. This is the first argument provided by the author against the Lily Thomas judgment. The author also says that there must be some exception provided for sitting members of legislature. He says that if an MP or MLA is immediately disqualified according to the Lily Thomas judgment, then it will result in some issues. The first issue is that sudden disqualification will result in lot of chaos and confusion. What if the convicted person is disqualified and a new person elected from the constituency? After some time, the convicted person proves his innocence through an appeal in higher court. So to address the situations like this only, Section 8, Class 4 of RP Act was provided. But this section was struck down by Lily Thomas judgment. Secondly, in case of sudden disqualification, the people of constituency will lose their representative. Finally, the constitution itself provides some exception to the sitting members of legislature under Article 103. So, striking down the Section 8, Class 4 is not valid. So, these are the issues in Lily Thomas judgment highlighted by the author. Lastly, the author feels that Lily Thomas case judgment hasn't led to any noticeable change. The politicians from ruling party have been able to delay their convictions within few hours. But the politicians from opposition party like Mr. Rahul Gandhi had to wait for four months to overturn the disqualification. So the author says that section 8 should be brought back and constitutionally protected. This is necessary to safeguard the careers of Indian lawmakers from sudden disruptions caused by court decisions. So this is all about this discussion. We have seen important points about Lily Thomas case, issues in that case and important arguments mentioned in the editorial. So this is very important topic for mains examination. Don't miss it. Now let us move to the next part of our discussion. Take a look at this article. See few days back Madras High Court has taken up Suyamoto revision against the discharge of state education minister from a disproportionate assets case. Following this, the court has also taken up Suyamoto revision against the discharge of revenue minister and finance minister who are acquitted from disproportionate assets case. So this is the perfect example of judicial activism. So in this discussion, we shall see important points about judicial activism. First, what is judicial activism? Judicial activism denotes the proactive role played by judiciary in protection of rights of citizen and in the promotion of justice in the society. In other words, it implies the assertive role played by judiciary to force other two organs of government 
to discharge their constitutional duties. For example, in Vishaka vs. State of Rajasthan case, 1997, the judiciary has stepped out of its duties and laid down guidelines to protect the woman from sexual harassment at workplace. Actually, this is a function of government, but in this case, the judiciary has taken up this function to restore the rights of affected persons. So, this is an example of judicial activism. The practice of judicial activism first originated and developed in USA. In India, the doctrine of judicial activism was introduced in mid-1970s. Remember, the concept of judicial activism is inherent in judicial review itself. So, in India, if a law is found to be inconsistent with the provisions of constitution, the Supreme Court and High Courts have the power to examine the constitutionality of law and can declare the law as unconstitutional. So, we can say that judicial activism is a form of judicial review in which judges participate in lawmaking policies. The concept of judicial activism is also closely related to the concept of public interest litigation. This PAL was actually created by the judicial activism of Supreme Court. This means that PAL is the outcome of judicial activism. Now we shall see what are the issues associated with judicial activism. See this judicial activism has led to many controversies in regard to supremacy between parliament and Supreme Court. It can also disturb the principles of separation of powers which is one of the basic structure of constitution. Another important issue is overstepping of constitutional boundaries by judiciary. Critics argue that courts have overstepped their constitutional boundaries and encroached into the functions of government and legislation. They contend that courts should refrain from making policy judgments and instead devote itself to interpreting the law. Next important issue is lack of expertise. Critics also argue that judges often lack the expertise to make decisions on complex policy issues. And the next issue is damage to democratic institutions. Judicial activism can also damage democratic institutions. When the court take on policy making role, it can undermine the authority of elected branches of government. This can lead to a loss of public trust in these institutions and a decline in democratic participation. Despite these concerns, there are also some benefits to judicial activism. For example, it can protect the rights of people and check the excesses of other branches of government. It can also help to bring about social change and to address important issues that may not be otherwise addressed by political process. In simple words, the judicial activism is required to protect the rights of individuals and to promote social justice and also to ensure the government accountability. So, this is all about the judicial activism. Now, we can move to the next part of our discussion. This article talks about inflation in India. According to this article, CPI headline inflation was 7.44% in July. This is above 6% target set by RBI. But you have to note here that CPI core inflation, which excludes food and fuel prices, was only 4.9%. This shows that high inflation that India is experiencing currently is due to food and fuel prices only. According to this article, the finance ministry has mentioned some reasons for current high food inflation in India. The first reason is that termination of Black Sea Grain Initiative. This has resulted in disrupted supply of wheat and sunflower oil to India. This also increased the prices of wheat and edible oil. The second reason is white fly disease and monsoon. So this has affected the domestic production of tomato, thereby resulting in the major spike in tomato prices. Finally, India also witnessed a deficient Thur Dal protection this year. This also caused a spike in Dal prices. So these are the reasons why India is currently witnessing high food inflation. So this is about the news article. In our discussion today, we will cover basics about inflation. First, what is inflation? Inflation, as we all know, is nothing but a general increase in price level. Inflation can occur when there is high demand in economy or it can occur when there is less supply in the economy. Based on the causes of inflation, inflation can be classified into two types. They are demand pull inflation and cost push inflation. 
First, demand bull inflation occurs when there is money supply in the economy increases. Simply put, demand pull inflation occurs when more money chases less products. Increase in house rent due to increase in disposable income is an example of demand pull inflation. On other hand, cost push inflation is due to the supply side constraints. If you can remember, recently the prices of graphic cards and processors increased due to silicon shortage. This is an example of cost push inflation. In addition to this, inflation can also be classified into creeping inflation, walking inflation, running inflation, hyperinflation based on the rates of inflation. Now what can be done to control inflation? Inflation can be controlled either by RBI using monetary policy or by the government using fiscal policy. First let us take up the monetary policy. In case of monetary policy, RBI uses tools like repo rate, CRR, SLR, open market operations and credit control policy to control the money supply in economy. Now let us understand the working of monetary policy with the example. Let us say there is high inflation in India due to excessive money supply. In such times, the RBI can raise the repo rate. So when the repo rate is higher, commercial banks are less likely to borrow from RBI. As a result, commercial banks might be more cautious in extending loans to business and individuals. When the business and individuals receive lesser amount of loans, they won't make a new investment and they will control their expenditure. So this automatically reduces the money supply in economy. When the money supply comes down, then the inflation will also comes down. So this is how RBA use monetary policy to control inflation. Now let us see the fiscal policy. In fiscal policy, the government either expands or contracts its expenditure or increases or decreases its tax rates in order to control the money supply in economy. For example, let us assume inflation in India is due to increased consumer spending and demand. Now the government can control the inflation by postponing pay commission or by cancelling some planned infrastructure projects. This results in decreased money supply in economy. As the money supply decreases, the demand decreases and then the inflation also decreases. So this is how fiscal policy works. Now we shall see the impact of inflation on various sections of economy. First, consumers. Inflation can erode the purchasing power of consumers, making it more difficult for them to afford goods and services. This can lower the living standards of consumers. Next is business. Inflation can increase the cost of doing business such as wages, raw materials and energy. This can lead to lower profits and job losses. Next, investors. Inflation can reduce the value of investments such as stocks and bonds. So this leads to lower returns and discourage investment. Inflation can increase the government's debt burden as it has to pay more for its earlier debt. This can lead to higher taxes or reduced government spending. So if you see the economy as a whole, Inflation can slow the economic growth and can lead to higher unemployment and lower living standards. So this is all about this topic. Now let us move to the next part of our discussion. Take a look at this article. According to the article, the National Human Rights Commission has issued a notice to DGP of Haryana and the District Magistrate to submit a detailed report on incident happened in Haryana. What happened is a Hindu family has shared anti-Rohingya post on social media, but they live in a Muslim-dominated village. For this matter, the family has been attacked, threatened for life and ordered to leave the village. NHRC says that this incident is a violation of basic fundamental rights and seeks explanation from the authority. So this is the crux of the article. Now we shall quickly go through important points about NHRC in prelims perspective. See, National Human Rights Commission of India was established on 12th October 1993 under the Protection of Human Rights Act 1993. So, it is a statutory body and not a constitutional body. Its headquarters is located in New Delhi. Know that in 1993, the United Nations General Assembly in Paris adopted a resolution regarding the principles of human rights. These principles came to be known as Paris Principles. The NHRC was established in India in conformity with this Paris Principles. 
ஸோ பேசிக்கலி என்ஹெச்ஆர்சி ஒர்க்ஸ் ஃபார் ப்ரொமோஷன் அண்ட் ப்ரொடெக்ஷன் ஆஃப் ஹியூமன் ரைட்ஸ் நவ் லெட் அஸ் சி த காம்போசிஷன் ஆஃப் என்ஹெச்ஆர்சி கரண்ட்லி என்ஹெச்ஆர்சி இஸ் அ மல்டி மெம்பர் பாடி கன்சிஸ்டிங் ஆஃப் சேர்மேன் அண்ட் ஃபைவ் மெம்பர்ஸ் த சேர்பர்சன் ஷுட் பி எ ரிட்டையர்ட் சீஃப் ஜஸ்டிஸ் ஆஃப் இந்தியா ஆர் அ ஜட்ஜ் ஆஃப் சுப்ரீம் கோர்ட் ரிகார்டிங் த ஃபைவ் மெம்பர்ஸ் ஒன் மெம்பர் ஷுட் பி எ ரிட்டையர்ட் ஆர் சர்விங் ஜட்ஜ் ஆஃப் சுப்ரீம் கோர்ட் and one member should be a retired or serving judge of high court and the other three members should be among the persons having practical experience in human rights issues important thing to note here is that out of three members at least one person should be a woman in addition to this five permanent members there were seven deemed members who are chairpersons of various national commissions like national commission for scheduled caste national commission for scheduled tribes National Commission for Women, National Commission for Minorities, National Commission for Backward Classes, National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, Chief Commissioner for Persons with Disabilities. So these are the seven national commissions and the chairperson of these seven national commissions act as deemed members for NHRC. So in total the commission has one chairman, five full-time members and seven deemed members. The chairperson and members are appointed by president based on the recommendations of a committee this committee has six members prime minister speaker of lok sabha home minister leader of opposition in lok sabha leader of opposition in rajya sabha and deputy chairman of rajya sabha so based on the recommendation of this six member committee the president appoint chairperson and other members of nhrc now regarding the term of members chairperson or members of nhrc holds an office for a term of 3 years or until they attain the age of 70 years they are eligible for reappointment as chairperson or members of nhrc but note that the chairperson is not eligible for further employment under indian government or any state government now coming to the removal process the chairperson of nhrc can be removed from office in accordance with the provisions of protection of human rights act 1993 In order to remove a chairperson of NHRC first a motion of removal should be moved in Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha by a minimum of 100 members the motion must be accompanied by a statement for the grounds of removal after considering the motion if the parliament passes a resolution by simple majority then the chairperson of NHRC shall be removed from the office the chairperson can also be removed from the office by president on the ground of proved misbehavior or incapacity in such case the president must refer the matter to supreme court for an inquiry if the supreme court after an inquiry reports that the chairperson has been guilty of proved misbehavior or incapacity the president may remove the chairperson from office remember the salaries allowances and other service conditions of nhrc are determined by central government so this is all about nhrc Now let us move to the next part of our discussion. So we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Now look at the first question. It is about Bharat NCAP. We have to find how many statements are correct. The statements 1 and 3 are correct as Bharat NCAP cars will be crash tested and given points which translate into stars. Third statement says implementing Bharat NCAP will bring India at par with other parts of world like US. So this statement is also correct. Look at the second statement. Bharat NCAP is only voluntary and not mandatory. So the statement 2 is incorrect. So the answer is option B, only 2. Now look at the second question. What is the fundamental characteristic that distinguishes judicial activism from judicial restraint? Here we have to understand that judicial activism is a proactive role of judiciary in public policy. And judicial restraint is a limited role of judiciary in public policies so the correct answer is option b extent of involvement in policy making so this is the quiz question for you today post the answer in comment section and this is the main question for you today try to write an answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the discussion if you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ai's youtube channel thank you